So I have the uh, pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Sontag uh, today. My name is Yen Opinion Pong, I'm one of the assistant professors in the uh, Center, of, not this, uh, CHIDS, the Center for Healthcare Innovations and Discovery Sciences. Um, so I have the esteemed pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Sontag. Uh, he is what we call a rising star, and uh, we are so fortunate to have him in our medical field. Uh, he has devoted his research to thinking about problems in medicine and how to bring some of the uh, state-of-the-art techniques and machine learning and data science uh, to us. So very lucky to have him. Uh, Dr. Sontag uh, got his BS at UCLA, Berkeley? No, UC Berkeley and then uh, his PhD and master's at uh, MIT. Uh, he, is in the, he runs the clinical machine learning lab here at NYU, and he's assistant professor uh, in computer science and data science at NYU and Quran. He is also uh, the area chair for some of the top, for the top uh, computer science machine learning conferences uh, in the country and in the world. And so we are very lucky to have him and, and thank you so much for coming today. Thanks Ian for the introduction. So it's a really exciting time to be a computer scientist working in healthcare. In the last eight years, the adoption of electronic health records across the nation has increased by a factor of nine, from 9.4% in 2008 to well over 84% today. Now the data in electronic health records is largely unstructured, it includes quantities like clinical notes, laboratory tests, vital signs, and imaging. And increasingly over the last couple of years has also included quantities like genetics and proteomics. Now, there are also a number of quantities which we don't traditionally think about as health data that are of increasing importance to thinking about how human health is evolving. Data that's collected on mobile phones, social media, and devices such as Fitbits. Now, this data is being collected in an increasingly structured and broad manner. So for example, the President's Precision Medicine Initiative is creating a one million person cohort, which will have a core data set for each of these million people, including data derived from electronic health records, health insurance claims, and laboratory data. All of this is, goes to say that there's enormous opportunity for machine learning and algorithms that work with this data to be used to better understand and manage human health. Machine learning, which is my particular area of research, uh, has been studied for well over 40 years uh, in terms of how machine learning can improve healthcare. And only recently, however, we've started to see translation of these research ideas into clinical practice. So for example, a few years ago, there was a computational pathologist, which was developed by Beck et al, that took data from, imaging data from, uh, from breast cancer uh, slides, pathology data, to try to understand what is the pro five year prognosis for patients with breast cancer. And we should expect to see both on the radiology and pathology side many more advances over the next few years being translated to the bedside. In my own lab, we've used health insurance claims data on millions of different individuals to try to detect who among them have undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. We've also used data in electronic health records to come up with context specific displays of patient information, trying to bring the relevant data from a patient's past medical history to clinicians' fingertips, and ultimately improve clinical documentation as well. Now, these are what I would call, <coughs> what I would call easy cases, where traditional paradigms of machine learning can be applied to try to have a direct clinical impact. However, my research has been really tackling what I view as the next 20 years out, the harder problems, quantities like differential diagnosis and in silico models for precision medicine, where the traditional paradigm of gathering labeled training data and building a supervised machine learning algorithm does no longer apply for various reasons. So here at NYU, uh, I run a clinical machine learning research group, as Dean mentioned. And broadly speaking, our research focuses on two different areas. The first looks at how we can create the foundation for the next generation of electronic medical records where we are continuously reasoning as new data comes in about what's happened to patients in the past, what's going on with them now, and what we predict is going to happen to them in the future. And the idea is that this is going to become something like a software middle layer for the next generation EHR, so that programmers, like at Epic and other places, could write software that looks at these variables and changes the way that clinicians interact with the patient data. Now the second line of work in my lab thinks much more longitudinally about a patient's 
health and how it evolves over time, and is aimed at trying to use observational health data to understand about medicine and optimize medicine. And that is indeed going to be the focus of today's talk. The first one uh, I, I've spoken about in the past at the medical school, and I'd be more than happy to talk about offline. So we've been working over the last several years with insurance claims data provided in partnership with Independence Blue Cross, which has the advantage of being a very longitudinal view of a patient's health. So for example, we have every time a patient goes to see a doctor, we have the we, we know which doctor the patient saw, what specialist they are, where they, saw the, where they saw the clinician, diagnosis codes associated with the visit, and so on, across time for that individual. In addition, any time a patient goes to fill a medication in a pharmacy, we have a record of that fill, again, across time, and would allow us to start thinking about how medications are changing due to diagnoses the patients are getting, and how that affects quantities like laboratory tests which we observe as well from patients longitudinal over time. Now, critically, this data that we look at doesn't just have the information about whether a test was performed, but we also have, for, bo for both blood and urine results, the actual results of the lab tests, which give us a very good understanding of what's actually going on with the patient. Finally, we also have a lot of demographic data uh, about the patient across time. So this is just one illustration of how one could get a longitudinal view of a patient's health from observational health data. But the techniques I'll be telling you about over the course of today's talk are really broadly applicable to other types of health data as well, whether it be derived from electronic health records or other places. So the key types of questions that I want to be able to answer, and which the work I'm telling you about today is really just the tip of the iceberg, are as follows. First, we want to understand what are markers of disease stage and progression and statistics of what to expect when. This is really about characterizing chronic disease. So for example, suppose a 19-year-old woman is diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome, and she wants to know, what's my life going to be like? Over the next 20 years, what comorbidities should I expect to get? If I get pregnant, is my baby likely to have neonatal lupus, congestive heart block? What types of medications should I expect to have in, over the course of my life? And what will the cost of that be like? Now, these are very much about characterizing disease progression, not about interventions. And in the second half of today's talk, I'm going to return to that question of also how interventions can affect that disease progression. But of course, we don't want to just ask a broad question about one class of individuals characterized by just two facts women age 19, Sjogren's syndrome. We also want to be able to ask questions about, given everything you know about a patient, trying to forecast that individual patient's future disease progression. So for example, suppose you take an individual with small during multiple myeloma, and we want to understand when is that individual likely to progress to have full-blown multiple myeloma. Now, these two questions here, as are many of the questions I look at, are largely driven by my own personal history, as is the case with many people in healthcare. So my wife was diagnosed with Sjogren's disease at the age of 19. And these are the types of questions that she and I have been asking ourselves over the last decade. My mother was recently diagnosed with, type two, with multiple myeloma. Uh, and right now she's smoldering multiple myeloma, but we want to know when is she likely to progress? We know that everyone progresses, but when is she going to progress? How will that affect our life decisions, for example, where my wife and I might be located over the next several years, when we might need to expect to go provide additional help to my mother, and so on. And as I can imagine, many people in the room today uh, have other questions of this nature that they also would like to be able to address. So the key challenge with trying to answer these questions from observational health data is that we never have complete view of what's going on with the patient. So let's take that first question, for example, of what happens to me over, let's say, a 20-year time span if I'm an individual with Sjogren's syndrome. Well, we might attempt to take data in electronic health records, try to find many other individuals who have the same chronic disease, and try to fill in the dots of what might happen to me over a 20-year time span by looking and see what happened to other people with that disease. But at least here in the United States, patients use of healthcare is largely episodic and, and very often changes uh, de providers depending on what health insurance an individual is on or where they live at any po one point in time. So for example, over a 20-year time span for an individual, they, we might have data on them for only three or four years. 
So somehow, if we want to answer this long-term long, long question, we have to figure out how we could stitch together data across individuals. Now, in order to stitch together data across individuals, we somehow have to also figure out where are they in their current disease trajectory. So for example, patient one, patient one here might be very early in their disease trajectory. Patient two long, uh, might be further along in their disease trajectory. Moreover, we have to figure out also which data elements of the largely missing data should we be able to pull together that are relevant to me versus other people. So this is what we'd like to be able to do. So what I'll do now is I'll introduce a methodology that my group has been developing over the last few years to try to answer this question, to bring together data from across individuals and look at a longitudinal view of disease progression. And I'll do so using a case study of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. COPD uh, is a, a very common chronic disease in the United States and elsewhere, and it's largely caused by either smoking or, or pollution. It's a lung disease, but it's a systemic disease. It affects many other body organs and, uh, and, and long term has many comorbidities associated to it. Now we're going to try to ask the question of how we could learn a disease trajectory for COPD using data from almost 4,000 individuals where the data is derived from electronic health records. We only have two to four years of data for any one person and a lot of incomplete information. We only have documentation when an individual went to see a clinician and only a very small part of what's being documented do we actually use for this process. Now, in our data set, we have no idea of the ground truth of the patient's individual disease state at any one point in time. But one of the reasons why we looked at COPD as a test case is because COPD does have a good way of characterizing disease state. In particular, one would use a spirometry device, which is in essence a breath test, the patient breathes in and exhales, and one looks to see what fraction of the patient's breath is exhaled in a, at any one point in time, and use that to gauge where the patient is in their current disease trajectory. So this, the gold criteria is, is the current uh, um, methodology that's, that's typically used. Uh, and in our data set, we have neither access to spirometry information nor access to the, uh, to, to the patient's uh, uh, FEV or gold uh, criteria stage. So we're going to ask, for this disease where we already know a whole lot, could we at least try to reproduce what clinical knowledge already knows? And if we succeed at this, then we'll be able to take a more rare condition and attempt to apply the same methodologies to discover something new. So our approach is to build a, what's called a generative model. It's a probabilistic model of how a patient's disease evolves over time. And by the nature of the word generative, it also should have you starting to think about how one might be able to use the model, for example, to be able to sample candidate disease trajectories and look at even synthetic versions and see how that aligns with what we see in the real world data. We're going to show how one could use this model to derive a meaningful characterization of disease progression and stages, and how one could also try to use the model conditioned on what we know about an individual patient to infer that individual patient's disease trajectory. And more broadly, one hopes that these types of models would be able to be used for decision support for early intervention, for retrospective quality research, for example, trying to figure out data-driven guidelines for care plan management, or even to do comparative effectiveness studies, where one, one might want to be able to align patients across time by disease state in order to look at which medications are most effective at any particular point in the patient's disease trajectory. So here's the first picture that should be scary to all of you. This is this is a pictorial representation of a probabilistic model. And over the next five minutes, I'm going to walk through every single bit of this model to give you a sense of what this model is hypothesizing about a patient's disease trajectory and how we attempt to learn it from data. So at the very top, we have what I'm calling the progression stages of an individual. So S1 denotes the patient's disease stage at time step one. S2 denotes the patient's disease stage at time step two. And you should think of these S variables as being a number from, let's say, one to six, where one is early in the disease trajectory, six is late in the disease trajectory. Now, we're going to characterize how a patient with COPD is doing according to a number of different axes that summarize their different, ph different physiological statuses. Now, you could call these phenotypes, comorbidities, or different things. For this work, we look at whether a patient with COPD at any one point in time has type 2 diabetes, whether they're depressed, whether they have lung cancer, and a number of other quantities. And we're going to say that we could quantify patients' disease trajectory based on how they're doing along these different axes.
Now, we never actually observe the ground truth of these quantities at any one point in time. Rather, what we see, I'm illustrating on the very bottom here with these O variables, notes observations that, you see, that, you, that are collected in the patient's electronic health record. And arrows in this model denotes dependencies. So for example, we hypothesize that the patient's, whether the patient has diabetes at one point in time depends on whether they, had, whether they had diabetes at the previous point in time. Likewise, whether the patient transitions to have a new diagnosis of newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes depends on the patient's underlying disease stage at the previous point in time and whether they've transitioned in disease stage as well. So at the very top here, we have the patient's disease stage. And for this, we use what's called a continuous time Markov process, which you could think of as a, a very simple stochastic model of how a patient's disease stage evolves. At any point in time, there's some probability that patient's going to progress from having one stage to having the next stage. Now, this model is parameterized by the amount of time between observations. And this is important because we like to be able to learn from data where we assume that the observations are extremely irregular. And, one is, and this continuous time Markov process hypothesizes that the probability of transitioning from stage I to stage J is given to you by a matrix exponential of this time interval delta. Delta is the amount of time between the observations, uh, the previous observation and the current observation, times this matrix Q, where Q is a set of parameters that have to be learned as part of this model. And you'll see that there are many other parameters that have to be learned. And this is going to be an example of an unsupervised learning problem. Because we don't ever actually truly know the patient's disease state, or even whether they have diabetes or lung cancer, from the data that's in the electronic health record. Rather, we're going to assume that we have a noisy view of it. And the learning algorithm is going to simultaneously infer these parameters and hypothesize for each individual patient their disease state. So, Next, what I'll do is I'll look to see how do we characterize the patient's disease um, comorbidities at any one point in time. So I'm going to be looking at a vertical slice of this model. What we use for this is called a noisy OR model. At the very top here are latent variables that summarize what's going on with the patient at this exact point in time. So for example, uh, X1 might be whether the patient has diabetes, X2 might be whether they're depressed, and so on. Now, we don't assume that we ever observe these specific comorbidities. Rather, we assume that we have a number of clinical findings at that point in time, quantities like whether a diagnosis code was recorded for the patient, whether a particular drug was taken for the patient, or even perhaps text data derived from clinical notes. Now, as we know, these clinical findings are a very noisy view of what's actually going on with the patient. So part of the learning algorithm is to learn Number one, what edges exist here? So how the underlying phenotype relates to the clinical findings that are recorded. And second, what the noise rate is on that. So we're going to learn a weight for each one of these edges, which says, for example, if a patient has type 2 diabetes, how often 205.02 is going to be recorded in the patient's EHR at that point in time. So that's what we're going to call failure probability associated with every edge. And these are parameters of the model that we're going to learn simultaneously with everything else. Now, here we have a very specific notion of how we want to characterize disease progression, in particular along each of these axes. But remember, I told you that we don't want to assume that we know whether the patient truly has type 2 diabetes. So, this, so the key question that one has to resolve from a methodological perspective is how does one put meaning to a latent variable when doing this type of unsupervised learning? Now, in my group, we've developed a technique called anchors, which is a type of a finding, an observation, which we hypothesize to be caused by only a single comorbidity. So for example, one might say that the diagnosis code 205.02 could be recorded either due to complete chance or due to the patient having type 2 diabetes. And we don't want to hypothesize, we don't want to state that that code will be present every time the patient has type 2 diabetes, but there's going to be some noise rate associated to it. For each one of these comorbidities, a clinical expert specifies one or more of these anchors, and that, in, and that is going to be our way of specifying meaning to these latent variables, and brings together both data with clinical expertise. So, as I mentioned previously, the last bit of our model looks at how these comorbidities evolve over time. And for this specific study, 
we made the very strong assumption that later stages of the disease, for later stages of the disease, patients are more likely to develop comorbidities. And this doesn't hold for every chronic disease, but it's something that we believe to, be hold, for, to, believe to hold for COPD. And by putting this constraint into the model, we find that we can learn from much less data. So what I'll do now is I'll, give you, I'll do some introspection to show you what we learned across these 4,000 patients with COPD. The first thing we could look at is the, are the edge weights associated with the different phenotypes and the clinical findings that are observed. So for example, here look at kidney disease. What our model discovers is that these anchored variables, which I'm denoting with stars here, all of them, our domain expert says, could only be, could, would only be recorded in the patient's data if they truly had kidney disease. But what you see there under the weight column is the probability that our model learns for the likelihood to observe that particular finding given that the patient has kidney disease. And that's the noise part of the model that our algorithm learns. Now you see that there are also a number of things that we didn't explicitly put into the model. For example, we, we infer that quantities like diagnosis codes for anemia, um, uh, hyperlipidemia and other things are also often likely to be recorded for patients that have kidney disease. And some of these, of course, make sense, like it's well known that patients with kidney disease get anemia. Here's another example for lung cancer. In red here are the anchored clinical findings for this phenotype. And what you see again are the noise rates that are learned for uh, which, are, which are in that weight column. And these are the other items that are automatically inferred to be associated with, with lung cancer. And here's a last example of lung infection where the only anchor that was provided was for pneumonia. So once one's, one has learned the model, then one could try to apply it to infer the disease trajectory for any one patient. So for example, here you see a patient where we have three years of data. And I'm just giving you a bit of a caricature of what data elements were observed at each point in time. And at the very top here, you see the inferred disease progression, the, sorry, the inferred disease state for that patient at an, any one point in time. We infer the patient starts out in disease in state one, which is a very early stage of COPD, and about half a year into the, into the data, progresses to, into stage two. You know, notice that that progression aligns with what the model infers to be an onset of cardiovascular problems. Now, once one has learned the model, one could then ask the question that we started out with, which is, what does a 20-year view, or in this case, 10-year view, of the chronic disease looks like? And our way of answering that question is by sampling from the model, which we could do because this is a generative process. So what I'm showing you here, I'm going to show you for each one of the different comorbidities, the inferred fraction of the patients with the part, at the corresponding disease state that has that comorbidity. So first, let me describe to you the y-axis. The y-axis has years, and each dot refers to one particular disease stage. So this is the patient at disease stage 1, disease stage 2, disease stage 3, and so on. And the interval here between the first and the second dot, second and third dot, corresponds to the expected amount of time it takes to transition from one stage to the next stage. Again, as inferred by the model. So the model hypothesizes that the patients in early disease stages of COPD are very unlikely to have kidney disease, but that the prevalence of kidney disease increases as the number of years goes on, and the model hypothesizes that roughly 10 years into patient COPD, roughly 50% of people have kidney disease. Uh, this black line here is for musculoskeletal problems, the yellow line is for type 2 diabetes, and here I'm showing you for cardiovascular diseases. And now, we were quite surprised by this red line, uh, in particular that the model says that uh, even very early in the patient's disease, uh, in their COPD disease trajectory, a huge fraction of patients have cardiovascular disease. Now, of course, of the clinical people in the room probably don't find this surprising at all, and indeed that's well known in the clinical literature. But this is an example of what I'm telling you about uh, checking face validity of these models on a well-known clinical setting. And this gives us some encouragement. The fact that this aligns reasonably well with, cl with current clinical knowledge gives us some encouragement that next we could try to apply this to more rare conditions. And indeed, that's what my lab is working on now. So for the last 15 minutes of this talk, I now want to 
turn the table a little bit to look at what I view as the most important question in this field, which is not what's going to happen to a patient, but how we can affect that patient's disease trajectory. So for example, with, for this patient with multiple myeloma, if we were to give them treatment A or treatment B, how does that affect their disease trajectory? Or if you look at a more common condition like type 2 diabetes, of the six, seven second line diabetes treatments, as far as I understand, almost no one knows which second line diabetic treatment to give to any one patient. So could we try to use observational health data to try to figure out which second line diabetic treatment is most effective for whom? So the picture there looks a bit like this, right? So we've got some data on an individual and we wanna figure out what's going to happen to this individual if they take drug A or drug B. Well, the typical approach to try to answer this question is to find patients who took drug A and look like me and to find patients who took drug B and look like me and look to see what happened to each of these patients in the future. Now, as you can see by this caricature, this problem is much more challenging to do from electronic health records due to the fact that we have tons of missing information. For example, from just a little bit about we know about me and the little bit we know about patient one, we have to somehow figure out that we are alike and that we might respond similarly to the treatments. Similarly, one has to somehow derive the outcome of interest from the electronic health records as well. And each of these problems is a PhD, a PhD into itself. Now, we're not just interested in asking the question of what happens to patients if they take one drug, because most adults in the United States have multiple comorbidities and are taking not just a single drug, but multiple medications. So the picture looks a little bit more like this. Patient two might be on drug C and drug B, and if patient two is doing well in the future, somehow we have to figure out, was that due to drug C, drug B, or the combination of the two? So we need models that are able to take into account that patients have multiple conditions, multiple treatments, and we have to deconvolve the effect of what each of those treatments. And what I'll describe to you next is an approach that we've been developing to do precisely that. So the approach goes by the name of deep Kalman filter. Like the previous approach that I described, it's a stochastic model of how a patient's disease state might evolve over time. Except this model is going to be a much more flexible model. Whereas previously, we made heavy use of clinical domain knowledge to characterize what we mean by a patient's disease state, what are the axes that we want to characterize it, for example, cardiovascular conditions, uh, dep uh, depression state, and other things. Here, we're going to go the complete other extreme and use clinical domain knowledge only for helping us understand what are the treatments that we want to infer the effect of. Everything else is going to be learned in a purely black box machine uh, fashion. And you know, from a, from a personal perspective, this is exciting to me because I want to really understand better these two extremes, right? Using a lot of clinical domain knowledge versus not using clinical domain knowledge. Uh, and over the next five, 10 years, I hope to really understand the advantages and disadvantages of each of these two approaches. So let me walk you through what this model is stipulating. First, like before, we're hypothesizing, hypothesizing that a patient has some disease state, which we're calling the Z variable, that is evolving with time. So as you move to the right here, that's time for a single patient. Now, unlike before, where we said that the patient's disease state is characterized by a single number from one to K, where K might be five or six, here we're going to assume that the patient's disease state is a very high dimensional quantity. In particular, we're going to assume that their disease state is a hundred dimensional continuous valued vector. So we're not going to necessarily be able to infer some meaning to each one of these dimensions, but our hope is that by using this model, we will be able to infer how the patient's disease state will evolve in terms of what it does to the patient's disease, patient's observations and how actions affect those future observations. So in particular, these U variables, the action variables, correspond to what actually happened to a patient at that point in time. U1 is a vector describing what medications or procedures were performed at that, at that point in time. It could be a day, it could be a month. These X variables denote everything we observe about a patient in their electronic health record. For example, blood and urine test results, diagnoses that could be recorded, notes that could be written by clinicians, and so on. Now, we're going to learn this model from a large cohort of individuals. And then when we want to ask the question of what would have happened to a patient under some intervention, namely the counterfactual question, we do it by forward sampling in the model after fixing the interventions. 
So for example, suppose we observe X1, X2, U1, and U2 for a patient. So let's say the first two months of data for the patient. We would use that to infer the Z variables for the patient up to Z3. Then what we would do is we would hypothesize, we, we, we would stipulate that there would be a particular action U3 performed for a patient. For example, treatment A being performed, or maybe in a different world, treatment B being performed. And after setting U3 to be either treatment A or treatment B, we then simulate forward in the model to, for example, sampling Z4 conditioned on Z3, and then sampling X4 conditioned on Z4. And what that will give us then is the, um, it, we're going to be filling in the observations for the patient at the fourth time step as a function of what we knew about the patient in the past and the stipulated treatment. One would do the same simulation for a different treatment and then look to see what happened to a patient under each of those two conditions, under each of those two treatments. And in doing so, then try to understand which treatment perhaps might work better for that patient. So this gives us an in silico model that allows us to test the effect of different interventions. Now, we don't want to assume anything about how a patient's disease state evolves over time. And we certainly don't want to assume anything about the linearity of how a treatment might affect that disease trajectory. As we know, treatments can affect patients in highly nonlinear fashions. So for example, if a patient has type 2 diabetes and you give them glucose, uh, they're in, they're at least the, their immediate, um, sorry, if you give them insulin, their immediate glucose values are going to drop. Right? So, we're going to try to learn those nonlinearities by using what's called a deep neural network, uh, which is a very popular tool these days in machine learning and allows one to learn highly nonlinear functions as part of the learning algorithm. So you see here on the bottom it, an illustration of the neural network that's used to characterize the transition distribution from the patient's disease state at one time step and the intervention performed at that time step to the disease state at the next time step. And this is going to be learned at the same time as learning the overall model. So one thing we do in computer science in order to try to test our, our assumptions and our learning algorithms is we first look at extremely simple settings. And we look to see how our complicated algorithms do in those simple settings where we think we know what the answer should be. So what I'll show you over the next few slides are first a synthetic setting, which is supposed to mimic what happens with real patient data. And then I'll show you a slightly less simple setting where we use real world data on uh, 8,000 diabetic patients to try to infer the effect of diabetic interventions. So this is what we call the healing MNIST data set. MNIST is a data set of handwritten digits. It's widely studied in machine learning. Um, and it actually has a lot of interesting history here because one of NYU's leading machine learning experts, John LeCun, uh, is one of the people who introduced the MNIST data set for the study of handwritten uh, digit recognition. So here we're going to say that a patient is a digit. Patient 1 is a 4, patient 2 is a 3. Now patients are evolving over time, and their, uh, their, their true disease state evolves depending on actions that were performed to them. So for example, for example, the action that we'll look at here is that of rotation. Patient one is being intervened with a medication that is rotating it to the right um, or to the left. Patient two is intervened with a medication that's rotating it in a different direction. So what we're going to ask is if we have data observing patients, disease states over time, can we learn the meaning of the intervention? Where here the intervention is rotation. Our learning algorithm only observes data of this sort that I'm showing you here. We never tell the algorithm anything about the intervention, rotation. If the algorithm is successful, it'll learn the meaning of rotation in such a way that we could then take a new patient, that is to say a digit, apply an intervention like 30 degrees, and see that it outputs a new digit which actually responds to the intervention as we hypothesized it should. Of course, patient data is way noisier than this. There are long range uh, observations that have nothing to do with interventions. For example, a patient might get a flu, it might last uh, a few weeks. We're going to illustrate, we're going to mimic that setting by putting these little white squares that appear at some random time uh, in the first five time steps and will last exactly three time steps. 
Of course, we don't ever truly observe what's going on with the patient. What we observe is much noisier. So we're going to mimic that by adding a huge amount of bit flip noise here. So the actual data that we're going to learn, for, learn from looks like this I'm showing you in the bottom. All right, so suppose we have that data for many thousands of patients. Now let's attempt to learn this probabilistic model that I showed for you in the earlier slides. Now the first sanity check, if this, if this learning algorithm is successful, we should be able to clean up the patient's data. So here are two examples of noisy, se noisy sequences from the training data. This is what's seen. After the model is finished learning, we can infer what the patient's true disease state is, and this is what's output. Right, so what you see here is the model was actually able to clean up the patient data. These things were never ever observed in the training data, but yet it was able to infer that that's probably what was going on with the patient. Now the second test case will be to see what happens to a patient if we apply a new intervention that wasn't ever seen in the training data to a patient that was never seen in the training data. So for example, here you see several different patients. This patient's a one, this patient's a five, and what we're going to do is we're going to be applying in the top here small rotations to the right and the bottom small rotations to the left where we start from what's shown in the first column and everything in the subsequent columns are samples from the model under that intervention. In this case, a small rotation to the right or a small rotation to the left. And you see that the model is outputting patients that are responding as we humans know they should respond to that intervention. So the model has successfully learned the meaning of that intervention. Here's an example of large rotations to the right and to the left, and no rotations. Okay, so this is just a sanity check that illustrates that our, our, our unsupervised learning algorithms are able to do some type of causal inference from observational data. Now, let's look at a slightly more realistic setting, although uh, we still have a long way to go, which is about learning the effect of anti-diabetic medications. Here we take 8,000 diabetic and pre-diabetic patients um, four years of data, uh, which we're going to bucket into three-month intervals. And we're going to look about, at about 52 different observations summarizing uh, the patient's laboratory test results, such as glucose, A1C values, uh, creatinine, and other quantities. And uh, in addition to comorbidities, that would be recorded using diagnosis codes uh, in the patient's record at that point in time. And we're going to model the effect of diabetic interventions. In particular, we look at nine different diabetic drugs, including metformin and insulin. And we're going to look to see how those diabetic interventions actually affect the patient's disease trajectory. Now, we know what to expect here. Right? Diabetic interventions will lower the patient's A1C values. So what we want to see is, is the algorithm able to discover that? And indeed it does. So here's an example of how we test the model to see whether it discovered what we think it should have discovered. So here we look at these 8,000 patients. All 8,000 of these patients did receive some diabetic treatment. We're going to align those 8,000 patients by time, and time step zero is the time when the patients first got a diabetic intervention. We're going, then going to take all the patient's data up to time step zero, and simulate in the model what would have happened to this patient if they did or did not receive the treatments that they actually received. So on the left here, we show sampling future observations using the treatments that truly were observed in the patient data. And we see that um, these patients, after receiving diabetic treatment, uh, largely had, uh, few of them had high glucose values. Now we could also ask the counterfactual, something that was never observed in the, in the patient data, Namely, at time step zero, when the patients truly did get diabetic treatment, what would have happened to them had they not received diabetic treatments? So here now we're going to do forward sampling in the model where we hold out the intervention. We don't give them those drugs. And, we, and what you see here is that the model hypothesizes that a much higher fraction of those people have high glucose values. And again, this quantity shown on the right was never ever observed in the data. So it's an example of how we can infer, do the counterfactual inference, which of course we now want to scale up in a much bigger way. So this last approach I just mentioned to you of using what I'm calling deep Kalman filters to learn disease progression, I view as having huge potential in healthcare to tackle not just this problem that I mentioned of counterfactual estimation or figuring out how a patient will respond to some intervention, but also to a whole range of other clinical tasks. For example, 
After learning this model, we could try to infer the patient's disease state and ask to try to find different patients who have the same disease state. And this would then give us a similarity metric for finding similar patients. One could use that then within, for example, uh, electronic health record system where you could click a button, what's called the green button in, in, in the recent literature, to try to find recent patients who are like this one and help use that to guide patient care. One could also try to use these models to infer disease subtypes. I think the most exciting way to try to use it to discover disease subtypes would be to ask how does a patient respond to one of very many interventions. So in the data, you typically only observe a patient getting one intervention at any point in time. However, using this learned model, you could then ask how would this patient have responded to these 10 other interventions? And we could then cluster patients based on how they respond in silico to all 10 of those medications. Patients who respond similarly, we might hypothesize to be similar. Once we find similar patients, we could then go back to the, to the clinic, back to the bench, and try to do experiments to, decide, to try to infer why these patients were similar, and use that ultimately to get new knowledge about medicine. Now, one could also use these types of models to discover anomalies in patient data. As you can see, the model describes the likelihood of observations. If you see an observation that's highly unlikely according to the model, perhaps it's a sign that there was an error in recording the data, or perhaps this patient has something which, which is very unusual by typical clinical practice and deserves closer look. Now, I'm a computer scientist, and although I care very deeply about healthcare, I also spend a lot of my time thinking about how the methodologies I'm working on apply much more broadly to the world around me. So this approach, we've found, can apply well beyond just healthcare. For example, it could be used by massively online classrooms to try to ask the question of, after observing data of what students are, uh, what, how they're responding to questions over time, we could ask the causal question of, what is learned when we ask a student a specific question? Or we could look at climate modeling, where, again, this is a, a setting where all we have is observational data across long periods of time, but there are causal questions we want to answer. For example, what would be the effect of a new policy that is forcing a decrease of admissions by, emissions by some percentage? These questions also arise in political science and many other areas. And these models are not just useful for answering causal questions, they're also useful from a purely time series modeling perspective. So, in a test case of this, what we did is we took music. We took, Johann, we took um, Bach's chorales, uh, about 60 different chorales, and we tried to learn a model of how one could play Bach. So after taking these 60 different Bach pieces, learning the model over, um, uh, of learning the model where the model says at each point in time there's an observation corresponding to the 80 different keys of the piano, which are either one or zero for whether the piano is pressed at that point, whether that key is pressed at that point in time or not, we could then sample from the model. And this is what comes out. Oops. Media not found. I'm going to disconnect this, I think. Or. Because you weren't expecting this in the talk, huh? Yeah. Let's see if this works. Uh, that's a bummer. Let's see if I can just find it. Oh, oh, because I see, because I changed computers. Hold on a second. Now you can hear from this. Okay, so those of you who are musicians know that that doesn't sound anything like Bach, but at least hopefully it uh, it should sound uh, at least coherent and interesting. So all that is to, to say is that these algorithms are very powerful. They're, um, th that's the exact same code that we used to learn the disease progression model. We now apply to piano data and, and sampled from it, and that's what you heard. Uh, by the way, it's also one of the state-of-the-art results for music modeling.
Okay, so that's all I want to say to you today. Um, just to, to summarize, uh, I'm, I'm down at the square. Uh, I'm in the computer science department. Uh, for the last five years, I've really been enjoying working with people up at the medical school. Uh, I also have an appointment in population health up here. Uh, and I'd love to, uh, to work with all of you. So uh, I think we should have some time for questions. Thanks. Well, part of the focus of my research has been to develop algorithms that could learn from very, very little data. And so this algorithm that I showed you here, this, oops, deep Kalman filter, uh, should be contrasted with other approaches in the machine learning literature in recent years. For example, an approach called recurrent neural networks that are very widely used for time series modeling. Recurrent neural networks make very few of the assumptions that we're making, and as a result, can overfit dramatically to data. Here, you'll notice that there are some critical assumptions that we're making. So for example, we're hypothesizing that the observations of the patient at time step two are conditionally independent of the observations of the patient at time step one and three if we were to know the patient's disease state at time step two. Those conditional dependence assumptions of our model allow us to learn from much less data. Uh, and is one of the big innovations of our approach. Now, one can try to control for the complexity of the model in many ways. For example, here you'll see that we're saying that patient disease state is summarized by a 100-dimensional number, uh, one vector. One could try to change that to be, let's say, 20 dimensions or 10 dimensions. And one could then test to see how well we're generalizing to unseen data and use that to guide the choice of models so that you don't overfit to the data that you do have. What we found is that these models can learn from very little data. So I gave some numbers already here, right? For example, in the COPD case, we learned from a data set with 3,000 patients. In the diabetes case, we're looking at 8,000 patients. That should give you a ballpark view. But the problems you're raising are, 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 are valid and are precisely what I grapple with every day in my research. Right? We need to figure out how we could bring in, for example, as much domain knowledge as possible, clinical domain knowledge, in order to be able to learn from Little Mountain's data and not miss those important connections that you're alluding to. Yeah. Um, how did you measure the type of unsocial models? What kind of metrics did you, I guess, you didn't talk about? Yeah, sure. Um, so, what I've been talking about today are largely unsupervised machine learning approaches. So because they're unsupervised, there's no notion of ground truth that we can necessarily compare against. So for example, for the COPD application, um, our way of evaluating did we learn something reasonable was to compare to what's known in the clinical literature, in, 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 the, in the published literature. For the diabetes case I showed you here, our way of validating that the model is doing something reasonable is to look to see whether what the model predicts as the effect of diabetes treatment is what we know to be true for, di for diabetes treatments. But this is one of the key problems with causal inference, generally speaking, which is these are, we, we don't know what the counterfactual answer is. And so part of the research is to try to hypothesize that. And one has to come up with checks and balances to check the sanity of your, of your conjectures. And we do things like that. Now, that isn't to say that I can't give you an answer. So here are some things that one can use to quantify how your models are doing. One could look at learning on one set of patients and evaluating on a different set of patients. And the metric which could be used to quantify whether your model is capturing the structure of the patient's data is called held out likelihood. So you look to see for a patient who wasn't using the training data, what is the probability of their observations that are actually recorded in their electronic health record under the learned model. If the model says that these patients' observations are extremely unlikely, then possibly what happened is that you've either learned a very weak model or you've overfit to your training data. And using that held out likelihood criterion, one could compare different models. But I should emphasize that, that's, that that criterion does not tell you how well your model would do at answering a counterfactual question. That 
is impossible to answer without many, many more assumptions, but it's something that my lab is working on, on giving new theory for trying to do so. Another thing that one could do using these types of models to, is to ask how well one's doing at forecasting for patients. So for example, you could look to see, given the patient's data up to some point in time, predict what data, what might happen to the patient five years into the future. And then one could look at, for example, if your model says that this patient is likely, is likely to get type 2 diabetes three years out, for patients that were not used while learning the model, how often did it pr correctly predict which patients did get type 2 diabetes, which ones did not? Uh, so hopefully that gives you some sense of, of some of the criteria we use. In the back? Oh, great question. So, this, uh, so the question is, uh, how do you use this approach with new treatments? Uh, critically, everything I described to you today does not deal with that problem. So our model assumes that we have data where that action or that treatment had been performed. Right? So, so this part of the research has been really aimed at using observational health data where perhaps treatments weren't used always for some um, uh, used for the same purpose that you're thinking about now, but they were used at least in the past. We have some data on them. Now, I have been thinking about this question that you're raising of how you could try to use this for new treatments. Uh, and a couple of ways to try to do so are as follows. One way would be to try to use, uh, t to use these, these models to learn a mechanistic model of how a patient might respond to every, er, to every treatment. Uh, and that mechanistic model, once you learn it, could then, could, could then perhaps be generalized to new treatments if you know something about how those treatments perform. For example, what, how it affects particular regulatory processes. Uh, but that requires really digging into the, uh, the, to the internals of these models and modifying them quite a bit, which I didn't talk about today, but I'm very interested in. A second approach to this problem would be to, um, to say, suppose we have a few examples of patients that respond well to a treatment. Um, if we could, uh, or let me not say respond well to, so one area where this is related but not directly answering your question has to do with clinical trial enrollment. So suppose you have a, a new clinical trial, you're trying to figure out who are the patients that we should test this cl clinical trial on. Well, you might have some ideas of patients that you think would be good to have in your inclusion criteria. By using what I mentioned at the very end here, this um, this notion of finding similar patients by inferring the Z's and finding related patients to the Z's, one could try to take your data set of patients who, who are candidates for enrollment, take your query patient and try to find similar patients like that query patient. And although that doesn't directly address the question of how that patient will respond to this new treatment, if this, remember, because these similar patients are similar based on our hypothesized response to other treatments, Hopefully, we would then find a set of patients that might respond similarly to this new treatment as well. But this area is completely open, and you know, if you have ideas, I'd love to talk about it as well. Yep, Ian? How variant do you think the model is to um, the, the place where the data was collected? So like yeah, so the, these models should, these models intentionally do not generalize across institutions. Uh, and that was a design choice that I made. And the reason why I'm able to make that design choice is because these models also don't require much effort to run at each new institution. And so what we would do is we would take the learning algorithm, go to a new institution, take their data, and relearn the model to apply it to that new institution's data. And the reason why that's important is because the observations can vary dramatically depending on where you are or even across, institu across departments within the same institution. And one wants the model to be able to respond to those changes in data, and these algorithms have precisely that ability. Can you question about the state that you Does that actually correspond? Is that interpretable? Like no. So there's no, there's no reason to believe that those states are interpretable. Right? It could happen that if you look at the first dimension, that that corresponds to the patient's lung status. You look at the second dimension, it corresponds to their psychological status. Right? Possibly that would be the case. But there's nothing in our learning algorithm that would require it to be interpretable. 
That said, it's a research topic that I'm very interested in, and I have students who are now thinking about how to put in that interpretability constraint. And would that choice of dimension be completely arbitrary if some advantage to having some dimension? First, we find that the results are pretty robust to changing that dimension. Uh, but really, one of the key powers of this approach is that you can capture very high dimensional disease progression. So, for example, Remember how I mentioned that our model hypothesizes these, stipulates these conditional dependence assumptions. Well, if, if the z variable had only a couple of dimensions, then there would only be a small amount of memory from time step to the next time step. By having more dimensions, the, we can characterize more aspects of the patient's state that might become relevant not at the next time step, but maybe 100 time steps into the future. And so particularly when you're doing something like counterfactual inference, where the effect of the intervention might not be immediately obvious, having that ability to capture this, this high dimensional state of the patient could be particularly valuable. But all of that is future work. Everything I'm describing you here is describing 20 year research agenda for myself. All right, thank you. I guess so it's not on here.